Okay, so um, this is going to be uh, two things. We're going to do hypothesis testing and uh, regression analysis. Um, so there's a few tasks in here. Uh, first one is just to explore the data and just visually answer a couple questions. Next one is to do a formal um, hypothesis test. We're going to do the, um, the rank correlation test um, to see if there's a trend over time. So um, you can follow through that. I think, again, all, all the instructions and the formulas you need should be pretty clear. Um, table of the critical values you need is provided in the instructions. Um, and then the third task, well, and then the, the end of that second task will be to then make a recommendation on whether you should uh, reject or not reject the null hypothesis. In other words, should we treat sea level as if it's increasing or not increasing over time? Um, and then the, the last task will be to do a regression analysis on the data. So this is going to be a simple, um, simple um, linear regression using ordinary least squares. And we're going to use the built-in functions in Excel that, that do a lot of the work for us. And then based on that one, um, based on your fit, we'll, we'll, there'll be a couple of just general questions about what we observe. Um, from the fit and in terms of what we observe from the um, uncertainty. And then the last task is, um, this is, again, this is the data set that I showed uh, graphically in the first slide of the last presentation. There'll be a, uh, an opportunity to compare the results you get with the results that are, that are published along with this, um, with this plot. So you can see if, if it's similar or different, and if it's different, maybe think about why they might be different. Okay, so first task on this was just to explore the data a little bit. These are monthly uh, relative sea level observations dating back to um, 1913. And we have a run sequence or a time series plot that was given. So the first task was really just to, uh, based on a visual inspection, just make a judgment as to whether the data is stationary or whether it's non-stationary and changing over time. So I think it's, I think it's pretty, pretty obvious from this plot that um, the monthly relative sea level is increasing over time or has increased over time. So the suggested answer there is that it's non-stationary. Pretty straightforward, I think. Um, and then the second task was to practice doing a hypothesis test um, with the null hypothesis being that sea level is not increasing over time. And we're going to use uh, the Spearman um, rank correlation test. So in this test, we um, essentially rank uh, our two variables. So one is time or the date. And the other is the uh, relative sea level. So uh, in Excel, the way the way we did it for this exercise was converted the the date to its numeric value. So in Excel, when you enter dates as like month, day, and year, uh, you can convert them to the to an equivalent numerical value. Um, that allows us to rank them. Um, so we can do that using the rank function. I mean, we could have just filled it in, you know, one through whatever, um, since the dates are in order, right? The ranking can just be a, you know, this range of numbers, but in this particular exercise, we use the rank function um, and one um, because we're ranking them in um, smallest to largest. Really doesn't matter when you do it this way, as long as you do both of your variables the same way. So they either both need to be smallest to largest or largest to smallest. So as long as you're consistent, you're fine. And then we had to rank the sea level data. This is where you have to know a little kind of little more in depth of what some of these functions in Excel do. So in Excel, the rank function by itself, if you have repeats, it will give them the same rank and that's not gonna work for our, um, our test we're doing here. We need each value to have its own unique rank. We don't want to skip any values. Um, so the Excel rank function by itself will not do that. So there's a little 
hack we can do to get it to work. And oftentimes in Excel, if you know, if if, if there is, you know, if you're doing something somewhat standard, like this is kind of a pretty standard thing. Um, usually someone has already figured it out and discovered the hack for you. So you can often just through online searches find little hacks like this if you, if you get stuck with trying to get Excel to do things you want it to do. So in this case, we use the ranking function again um, to get the rank, but then we have to adjust for any repeats. So uh, this count if function that we tag onto it will account for any repeats. So basically, if I just pick one here, let me pick like the 10th one here. Um, so that formula is we're, we're figuring out the rank of our C level um, over all the data values, and then we're counting if there's any repeats uh, for any of the, the preceding values. So anything above the value we're currently doing, that's what this count if is. And you can put the, you know, if you put the dollar signs to lock the cells in the right places, uh, when you copy this formula down, it'll carry that that. Um, procedure down throughout the whole column of calculations. So we want to lock the, ter the the top value, but keep the bottom one unlocked because as we copy it down, we always want to take the current value and everything preceding it. Um, so that'll count any repeats. It'll it'll count the um, current value we're on as a repeat. So um, that'll put us one over. So we have to do a minus one here um, to to account for that. Again, one of many ways you could do this in Excel, but this, this way will work. So that gives us all of our rankings, and then um, we want to calculate the correlation coefficient, um, Pearson's correlation coefficient um, on the ranks, so on columns G and column H. Now the concept here is if, if, if um, of course time is, you know, time is always increasing, right? So the rank is always increasing as you go through time. And the sea level, if sea level is increasing, then you would expect to see more of the higher ranking values um, later in the sequence, right? And most of the lower ranking values should be earlier in time, right? So what that means is that if sea level is increasing, you will generally see a relationship where early years that have a low rank will, will also be um, correspond generally to lower ranks on the uh, sea level measurements. And then later years, which will have a higher rank in time, will also generally have a higher rank in terms of the sea level value. So when that happens, you will get a positive correlation, right? Which means that sea level might be increasing over time. If it's just random, right, if the sea levels are just randomly either large or small, then you won't see that pattern. And essentially the correlation coefficient is in a sense picking up uh, whether that pattern exists and how strong that pattern is. Um, so we calculate the correlation coefficient. We need to know how many data values we have, so we just use the count value for that. Uh, we can estimate the T statistics. So for this particular test, um, in the instructions, there is, um, let me find it here real quick. There are two different ways to, to kind of um, check the critical value for this test. One is you can get a critical value for the actual correlation coefficient, um, which is what's in this table here. And you can find those values are usually, um, you'll find them published in various places. So this is just, just an example table from a, from a random publication that had critical values in here. So this is the critical value. So you, if you were using this table, you would compare it to the correlation coefficient that you calculated. Uh, the way we did it in the exercise is, a, is a, a, another way you can do it. And when the number of data gets large, rule of thumb greater than 30, uh, you can do it by first calculating a T statistic um, as an approximation. So, and it's a pretty good approximation as n, n gets larger. So the formula for that is, is here. Rs is your, um, your correlation coefficient that you calculated on your ranked values. And n is the number of, of data that you have. And then once you have that T statistic, um, you can calculate 
the um, the value from the student corresponding value from the uh, student t distribution and Excel has a function for doing that. So in in this example, that's what we did. So here's the formula plugged in for the t statistic, and then um, that's the t st t statistic for our data, and then the critical t value. Uh, comes straight from the, again, the student T distribution based on um, the um, significance level or the alpha value we picked, which was uh, 0.05 and the uh, N minus two degrees of freedom. So just like with any of the other hypothesis tests, we then compare the um, our test statistic for our data to the critical value. And if our test statistic is greater than the critical value we reject the null hypothesis. So in this case, it's significantly greater. It's greater than 60 and the critical value is, um, is you know, one and a half or so. So in this case, it's pretty clear that uh, given our significance level, we chose in 0.05, there's a really strong compelling case to um, reject the null hypothesis and treat our data as if it is non-stationary and increasing over time, which is pretty consistent, obviously, with the with the visual that we get from the time series plot. Okay, so hopefully everyone got through that piece. Uh, the next task was to do a, a simple regression analysis using least squares on the on the data. So this is relatively straightforward, right? We, we the Excel has built-in functions to do um, the slope, which is m, or our, in in formal notation would be the, the beta one coefficient, and the intercept. Excel has a formula for that as well, which will be our you know our b value, or in the formal notation beta sub zero. Um, so that is our slope and intercept, and then we can calculate. Um, upper and lower confidence uh, limits on that, on the estimate of the slope, given um, uh, given that we've chosen a 95% confidence interval. So 95% confidence interval um, corresponds to an upper limit of 97.5 and a lower limit of 2.5. So, um, In order to do that, we need to we need a couple values here, right? So we need um, the t value, and we need the standard error of our estimator, right? So we do that over here in these columns off to the right here. Um, first thing we need to do is calculate what our predicted monthly sea level would be from our fitted model. So in this case, um, it, again, it's just y equals mx plus b, right, where, where um, x is the, is the variable that measures time. In this case, we use the, um, we're using relative date in years. Um, and then m is our slope and b is our intercept. So we can calculate all these predicted values and, and kind of if we want to visually, you know, check to see how they compare to the, to the um, observed values. We need to know what the um, average value of x is, our x variable, so that's time, right? So the average value of our date in years. Um, we need to know what confidence interval we're computing. We need to know how many data values we have. Uh, and we need the corresponding um, t statistic. So uh, for this, the upper comp we can use the upper confidence level of 97.5% and n minus two degrees of freedom. We can then calculate a corresponding, this is a little bit of a, just a, a shortcut way of doing it. We can calculate a corresponding Z value um, for a normal distribution for uh, given, uh, given that, also given that upper confidence limit. And then our standard error, this is just the formula we had in the presentation, right? So it's um, the sum of the uh, sum of the square of the residuals, right? On our, uh, our 
y values and um, the sum of the um, difference between the observed and the mean for x values, right? So that's over here in column P and Q, P and Q. So P is the square of the residuals, which is our um, uh, observed y minus our predicted y, so our observed sea level minus our predicted sea level squared, and then the x minus x, uh, the mean of x squared, right, is our um, relative date in years minus the average of all the relative dates uh, squared. So we plug that all into the into the formula that was given that was also in the presentation. And that should give us the standard error of our slope estimator. Um, and then we can then plug that into the equation where it's basically our, our best estimate or our, our estimator of slope plus or minus the T value um, times the standard error. And because this is symmetrical, right, we can, like I said, we can estimate the T value just for the upper confidence interval and then calculate it as a, as a plus here for the upper and a, a minus here um, for the lower. So that's the value there. Uh, there was a question in the chat about where's the uh, hypothesis represented in the calculation. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. I assume it's it's here. So um, maybe that, that was me. Uh, that's the other way. Maybe the hypothesis is the other way, uh, you know, it's not stationary, how would the calculation change? Um, I imagine, I, I normally don't, wouldn't recommend doing it that way, but I imagine you could probably um, do it in the reverse direction, right? You could, at least in principle, you could set your null hypothesis to say, that there that there is non-stationarity, right, and then test it. Um, I think the issue with that is going to be that the null hypothesis and these 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 tests and this test in particular, um, the null hypothesis is usually stated as if there's no relationship, and the test is formulated around that being the null hypothesis. So stationarity, basically, you know. Stationary would mean there's no relationship with time, right? The sea level is um, statistically independent of the time. It doesn't care what year it is, right? It's just some natural, you know, random process. And then non-stationary means there is a statistical relationship between sea level and time, right? So the way these tests are constructed, they're all, they're most almost all of them are constructed around. Um, the null hypothesis being that there's no statistical relationship. So I think you would probably have to go in and um, uh, reformulate the, the the hypothesis or the statistical test, right? Which I generally wouldn't recommend doing, I think. Um, yeah, because because you'd have to re you'd have to form so th this test is formulated around the idea that I'm assuming there's no relationship. And from the data I've observed, how likely is it that I would have seen the data that I saw, assuming there's no relationship, right? So all the all the formulation math stems from that premise. So if you switch the premise, you'd have to reformulate um, the test, right? To test for, you know, your going in assumption would be, I'm assuming there's a relationship. Now, how do I test whether or not that's true? I, I, I really haven't done it very often, if at all, to be honest. So I'm not sure the details on how you would do it, but I imagine it can be done. Thank you. Okay, uh, so going back to this one, so I think we pretty much had this regression analysis wrapped up, right, with the, the slope, the intercept, and upper and lower um, confidence limits on the slope. Uh, and then a plot here just to show how our predicted line um, compares um, to our observed data. So the last, uh, oh, and so again, you know, you should get values similar to similar to the values here. So th these are the actual um, these are these are the. Uh, values in terms of the um, 
the values that we're comparing in the next step, right? So the last step is to compare our results to what um, was published in the plot that was given to us by, um, by NOAA in the instructions for uh, analysis they did on the data. And we can make a comparison to see if we got results um, that were similar. So their results are basically the, the trend is generally an, an increase of like 2.52 inches per year, plus or minus, or sorry, uh, 2.52 that's in millimeters 2.52 millimeters per year plus or minus 0.14 so we got um we get two point at least in this in this version we get 2.54 so really close and plus or minus um maybe a little bit of a smaller number maybe that's more like plus or minus 0.08 or so so similar um but not the exact same value. So I don't know if anyone kind of had time to think about why they might be um, different than the values that are published on that plot that was in the directions. Um, I'll give you one of the reasons why they're different is that um, I think in the, in the analysis and the results that are portrayed on the plot, I think they first calculated um, an annual average. So, for each calendar year, they averaged the 12 monthly values and assigned that as the annual average for the year. And then they did the regression analysis on the annual average values. So when you do that, um, you'll get a slightly different result. And um, one of the results that you will get that we saw in this example is that since you're averaging on the front end, um, and turning these monthly values into average annual values and then doing the regression on them, uh, that will reduce um, the variance because you're essentially averaging out some of the variance. So that is um, part of the reason why our um, confidence interval is not quite as wide or it's smaller than the comp, um, or sorry, other way around. Yeah, that's why the confidence intervals are different. Um, and then the average will be slightly different. It wasn't that much different, but um, you know, you'll get very slightly, slightly different results. So if you were to redo this analysis, if you were to take annual averages first and then do the regression, I think you get a much closer, uh, if not the same result um, that they have in this, in this example. So confidence intervals, what they physically mean, yeah. So that was a question in the chat. So that that's still a really, that's a really tough one because you know, strictly speaking, we talked about this a little bit yesterday and again a little bit today. So the idea of a confidence interval in the frequentist uh, paradigm of probability is that it's the result. So, so the confidence interval is, is what is considered random. So the idea is that in repeated trials, so if you could conceivably repeat this experiment um, a number of times, right? that um, and you calculated a confidence interval each time. So each time you would get a different confidence interval, right? On uh, over the long run, over a large number of experiments, um, that confidence interval would contain uh, the true value in this example, 95% of the time or in 95% of those experiments, right? So that's a really tough one to wrap our head around intuitively, right? But that is, you know, Strictly speaking, that's the frequentist interpretation. And it comes from the, the, the paradigm in frequentist probability is, is that the parameters of our model are fixed, right? So the slope is some fixed value. There's no uncertainty in the slope, right? There's, there's a slope of this, of this data. Um, we just don't know what its value is, right? Um, so you can't put uncertainty, you know, you can't say there's a certain percentage of chance that our, the true slope lies within our confidence interval. Um, that doesn't have a, that, that's, that 
probability doesn't exist in the frequentist world, right? It's either inside or it's outside because it, it, it has one fixed value that we just don't know what it is. The more intuitive interpretation comes from the Bayesian world um, where um, the interval is fixed based on the data and it's the parameters that are uncertain. I think at least to me, that's way more intuitive and makes way more sense. And I think in practice is way more useful and in practice is how most people would interpret confidence intervals. So in the Bayesian world, when you're dealing with, you know, credible intervals or like prediction intervals, you're saying, um, given, given this model from this data, right? What's the probability that the true slope or the true um, rate of change, right? Is somewhere between, you know, 2.5 and 2.6 per year. And that based on our interval, you know, would have a probability of 95%. So we can actually assign a probability to it if we live in the Bayesian paradigm, um, which I think is way more intuitive. So again, that's the strict interpretation. Um, oftentimes we use them interchangeably, which is again, strictly speaking, not correct. We get away with it most of the time because the differences aren't very much um, but there are cases where the differences could be significant so you do have to be a little bit careful um, when making that distinction between confidence intervals and credible intervals I'm, I'm more of a bayesian thinker and that's my i, I actually prefer the bayesian paradigm so i tend to live in the world of credible intervals and prediction intervals but um, in you know in the classroom most of the formal education teaches um, probability statistics from the frequentist point of view at least in all the introductory courses that you'll find and uh, so most of us are taught the frequentist paradigm um, and again it's not going to get you into you know that much trouble very often you know, mixing the two up, but it's good just to be aware that there is, strictly speaking, a difference between the two. So I, I don't know if that's helpful or not, but, um, and, you, and you can construct, maybe maybe if I have time before tomorrow, you can construct a, uh, I'll make it, let me write down, grab a pen, I'll, I'll write down a note to maybe try to find some time to do a, do a quick little, um, demonstration experiment that can kind of illustrate maybe better what these frequentist um, confidence limits represent. So I'll try to do that before tomorrow. Um, okay, another question in the chat was, what's the benefit of doing this test for data sets that are obviously non-stationary? So, yeah, so that's... Um, that's a good question. I think you could um, you could probably get away with just saying, you know, obviously I can look at this plot and know it's non-stationary, right? And I don't need a I don't need a statistical test to tell me that. And I think that's generally fine. I think depending on you know what your application is, you know, if you were going to publish this in you know some sort of formal journal article, right? You know they would they would want even if it's obvious they would still want you to go through the steps of doing the test right and showing that it's you know that it that it's um, statistically significant even though from this plot obviously that was the result we were expecting right um so it really just depends on you know the application you're doing and and what the um, what the standard of care might need to be for your application, right? In some applications, just saying, you know, this is non, this is obviously non-stationary. Let's move on, right? Might be plenty good enough. And other other applications, you know, you might want to at least document it with a more formal evaluation. So either way is fine, right? It just depends on on your application.